country on this Memorial Day weekend. Of course, Memorial Day is a time when we honor and remember those who have died serving their country. And so I want to do that in a unique way this morning. I'm going to ask this. If you have a family member or if you know of someone that has had a family member who uh, has died, has given their life in service of this country, would you just stand in their honor? Would you do that now? Yeah. You know, along with that, I want to give you a special announcement. A couple folks from our church are sponsoring an event. This is a, a, a far in advance notice. It's going to take place on Veterans Day, and it's a Veterans Town Hall. Now, we don't know exactly where we're going to be at that point in time with all of our remodel, and so Harvest Bible has been kind enough to actually host the event at their church. But it's going to take place on Veterans Day and November 11th. And again, hosted by some people from our church. Jamie and Patricia are going to be in the lot. If you have any questions, you can stop by and ask them. Of course, we'd love to have you all participate with us in that. I think it's going to be a really special, special time. Also want to thank you guys for all of your prayers and your thoughts. You know, this church was given a very special opportunity. We were invited to uh, bring our services live into Lewis Prison. And so myself and some of the worship team and the tech crew, we were there uh, all day Friday. Yeah, you can see some of the video of us loading things up and heading down there. Of course, they don't allow you to take video uh, anywhere around or inside the facility, so we, we can't show you that. But, you know, I'm in my 50s now, and I haven't had too many unique experiences. You know what I'm saying? I've kind of been there, done that. This was a unique one because we ended up with level, level four inmates. Level five is lockdown. So level four inmates represent the guys who don't always uh, play nice, right? Not the most compliant group. And it was a really, it was an extraordinary moment to bring the word and worship in that context. And uh, the best part about it for me, and God answered my prayer, my hope is that we would get more invitations to come down. And it's all about, you know, sort of influencing the right people. And so the chaplains at the prison across the board were uh, overwhelmingly in favor of having us come back. And so surprise, surprise, there's a lot of bureaucracy that it, uh, has to, you have to go through to make that happen. But uh, we believe that God is giving us a unique opportunity. This is his, his doing, his, him opening up this door. And so they want to have us back. And so... Be praying for those opportunities. I, you know, you've heard me say before, ultimately what I would love, and we talked to them a little bit about this too. Again, it takes a bit of effort to make this happen, but I would love to be able to live stream our services into Lewis Prison. You know, how cool would that be to say, hey, the church at Lewis, welcome, you know? And so be praying. I, do you think God wants that? Without a doubt, God wants it. And he's already opening up those doors. So Appreciate you guys for that. So if you got your Bibles, we are gonna pick up where we left off uh, in the words of Jesus. And this actually brings this series to a close. We have been in it for several months. And the idea behind it was to let Jesus speak for himself. Seems like everybody has their thoughts and opinions about who the man is. Just open up the Bible. Allow his words to reveal who he is. And so that's what we've been doing. Next week, we will start a new series on heaven and hell, eternity awaits. We'll be answering questions like, what does Jesus say about hell? So in some respects, this is a continuation of, of Jesus' words. Jesus is, is, is one of his most favorite subjects to talk about with money. Talked about that a lot, because where your treasure is, your heart is. Jesus doesn't need money. It's not about the money. But the money is an indicator of where your heart really is. That's why he talked. He doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. Well, your heart is attached to your money. He also talked a lot about this place called Gehenna. So we're gonna talk about that. Talked about heaven, talked about the kingdom of heaven. And he answers the question, what happens to you when you die? So it's gonna be rich. We're gonna go through the summer, like I said, as it gets hot outside, you step outside, immediate application, especially when we're talking about hell. <laughs> Make you think about it. So that's next, that's next week. But today we receive this remarkable invitation from the Son of God. 
And it is an invitation that I need and every single person in this room needs, every person on the planet needs it. It is an invitation to rest. Is it just me or is our nation bifurcated? Is it, has it become official yet? <laughs> right? We're split. We're split. Not a lot of rest in that. People are concerned over whatever economic struggles may lie ahead. And then, and then not, not to mention the things that really keep you up at night are the bad decisions that your friends make, even more so. The bad decisions that your family members make. Just not a lot of rest. And Jesus says, I will give it to you. I will give it to you. It's amazing how the words of Jesus apply to humans throughout all of human history because whenever Jesus speaks, he's actually speaking to the nature of humanity. That's why his words resonate within you if you listen closely, if you're open-minded and, and open-hearted to what he has to say. Perhaps you've asked these questions. Will I always feel alone? Will anybody, will somebody love me in, in spite of my mistakes and failures? What do I do with all the guilt that I carry around? Can I share my real feelings with, with people and, and does anybody even care? I know I need help, but what will people think of me if I ask? What will happen to me when I die? Where will I go if, if anywhere? So many things that cause us to lose sleep and to experience anxiety. And in the midst of this, Jesus responds and he says this, come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, an invitation. I love invitations. This time of year, you get a lot of invitations, graduations, wedding invitations. The thing I love about invitations, perhaps you feel the same way, I can't attend all of them, but it makes me feel like people are thinking about me. And that's the beautiful thing about getting an invitation. Hey, you are being thought of. Well, this is an invitation unlike any other because it comes from the co-creator of the universe. And by the way, he knows what it's like to carry burdens. If you read his story, you find him being tempted by Satan personally, like one-on-one. -on -one. That's a pretty heavy burden. And then there was that moment in the Garden of Gethsemane where his sweat becomes as drops of blood. That's an, that's an extreme amount of anxiety. That's a heavy burden where he prays, if there's any other way of accomplishing the salvation of mankind rather than me being nailed to a cross, can we do that? Not my will, but your will be done. And the will of God is to have Jesus tortured, executed for the sins of humanity. And there's anxiety, extreme anxiety. Jesus, so it's not only an invitation, but it's an invitation from somebody who knows what it's like to carry burdens. Now in Jesus' day, there was a tremendous amount of pressure. People felt this pressure to perform for God. And this pressure was laid on them by the religious leaders because they believed it went from God to them to everybody else. And so if you wanted to please God, you had to go through us. Essentially what they were saying was, come to us, come to us. That's what makes Jesus, Jesus is very, he understands what's happening. He says, no, no, no. If you wanna find rest for your soul, they're not the ones you turn to. You need to come to me. So really at the heart, this is actually a spiritual rest first and foremost, and I'm gonna tell you why that's so important, but here's what Jesus had to say about these religious leaders. They tie up heavy burdens and they're really hard for the people to bear. They lay them on people's shoulders. However, they themselves don't lift a finger to move them. And this in verse 23, Jesus just blisters them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you're all hypocrites. You say one thing and then you do another. You have these demands for the people, but you don't fulfill them yourselves. For example, you tithe mint and dill and cumin 
but you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, things like justice, mercy, faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So if you can imagine, these guys were so tied up on the dues of religion. It's like, tithe, tithe, give to God 10%. And so they said, okay, we'll do that. And we're so spiritual that we reach into the spice rack. We open up the jar of dill and we take a tenth of it and we give it to God. And we go through every spice wheel, a tenth of it goes to God. That's how righteous we are. And God says, okay, that's good. But there's something you've missed, something that's actually weightier in a sense. It is more important than that because you can do the external actions of giving a tenth of what you have, but you ignore the justice the mercy that you should be showing towards others. You're neglecting people. There's one scene where Jesus uses a religious leader as this type who he's, he's, he goes on the corner and he begins praying out loud so other people can hear him and see how spiritual this person is. And then there's this sinner that comes up, won't even look toward heaven and he pounds his chest and he says, God, be gracious to me because I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, which one knows God? The religious guy? <laughs> or this guy that's just on his knees, he can't even bring himself to look to because he knows what's in his heart and he sees it rightly. Or this person, see, this is righteousness. And you know what this is? This is self-righteousness. So Jesus blisters him. You're making it hard for the people. You're adding rules. You're taking things to where God never took them. And now the people are, are oppressed. But first and foremost, this is a spiritual kind of rest. That's why he says it's a rest for your soul. The context is everything here. So let me read you the verses that precede what Jesus says. You've all heard, many of you are familiar with, come to me and I will give you rest, but you don't know what, what comes before it. Let me read it to you. At that time, Jesus declared, this is prayer. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. The things of God are not hard to understand, but people who are wise and proud in their own eyes, they think they got it all figured out. But then there's this, it's like the message of Jesus is so simple, kids can understand it. At one point, the disciples of Jesus are arguing over who's gonna be great in the kingdom. It's so messed up. They've been living with the guy who's the most humble human who's ever, ever walked the planet. It's not connecting with them because that's, what's, that's how rough it is. That's how difficult the human spirit can be. And so they realize Jesus is a king. He's been talking about this kingdom of heaven. Every king has his court. We're the entourage. He's gonna select from us. And they say, who's gonna be the best in the life to come? Maybe he'll make me his personal ambassador. Maybe I'll be his, his most his closest confidant. Maybe I'll be the prime minister. So they take it straight to Jesus. Jesus, you tell us, which one of us is gonna be greatest in the life to come? Jesus doesn't answer the question directly. He says, hey kid, come here. Calls over this little kid and he says, gentlemen, stop. You've got to change, turn. You wanna be great? You wanna know about greatness in the kingdom? It's this kid right here. And then he identifies what it is about the child. He says, it's his humility. You think this kid is concerned with being superior? You think this kid's trying to elevate himself above everybody else? He doesn't care. He's just happy to be in my presence. That's greatness. That's greatness. So the guys have bought into all these false notions, and it's like, no, man, it's, it's so simple, but very difficult because your fleshly desire is one of ego, pride, and arrogance. Now be like this kid. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal himself. In other words, what he's saying is, you've got these religious leaders telling you, I'll show you God, I'll tell you what God is like, and Jesus says, you wanna know God? Know me. You wanna understand who God is? I am his heart walking around on this planet. That's why you see me acting out of love, compassion, grace, and mercy. Don't go to them, come to me, and you will find rest for your souls. Fascinating language Jesus uses here. The word labor implies the burdens we put on ourselves either through our own misguided actions or because we're 
you know, workaholics or perfectionists, or we just, we've got caught up in the worry and anxiety trap, and we're constantly thinking about what if, what if, what if. These are burdens that we place on ourselves. That's what Jesus means by the word labor. Now, heavy laden, this expression is different. This refers to the burdens that other people lay on you. And there's a lot of them. Expectations, which you can never fully meet. This is what the Pharisees did to the people. So Jesus' invitation covers both kinds of burdens. Every kind of burden you have, like the ones that you bring into your life, the ones others bring into your life, I can, I can help you carry all of those. Now, what exactly is it about Jesus that enables him to load these burdens? Verse 29, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me because I am gentle and lowly in heart. I think this might be the only place where Jesus describes his heart. Humble, gentle, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I'm a, I'm a city slicker, raised, born and raised here in the city. Don't know much about agricultural life or farm life at all. Some of you people, some of you have been raised on a farm. You understand some of these concepts better than me. Here's what I had to learn. A yoke is a device, typically wooden, sometimes also made out of iron back in the day, and it joins two animals together, fitted around their neck. Typically, a younger animal was yoked to an older animal so that the younger animal could learn the ways of labor. Sometimes, if the ground was particularly hard and difficult to, to dig, Two experienced animals would be yoked together so that they would together, they, they, would, they would carry the burden of the hard ground. This is what a yoke does. Jesus says, I too have a yoke. And if you join yourself to me, your load will be carried. Uh, for me, this communicates an invitation to learn and follow and become what Jesus will later explain as a disciple, a disciple. A disciple follows in the footsteps of a rabbi, of a teacher. When you do this, your burdens are lifted. So there's this commentator, he makes three really good insights here about this. Number one, he says the yoke of Jesus is easy and light as compared with the yoke of others and their expectations upon you. Number two, the yoke of Jesus is easy and light as long as we don't rebel against it. Because Jesus describes his heart as gentle and humble, he's not some beast that just yanks you around and drags you around. He's, he's easy, light. However, if you try to separate yourself from the yoke of Jesus, you're probably going to feel some resistance that is intended for your own good to help you learn. Thirdly, he says this, the yoke of Jesus does not include the burdens we choose to add to it. Jesus says, don't consume yourself with tomorrow's troubles, but it's the nature of Jesus' heart that makes you wanna draw close to him and you will find rest, he says, for your souls. That's interesting, because he doesn't necessarily describe a physical rest, because that's almost impossible to give complete and total physical rest. But it is possible to get a complete and total rest of your soul. And this is important, because whatever burden you carry is very small in comparison to the burden that Jesus has already carried for you. And the burden I'm talking about is your eternal destination. See, your biggest problem in life is that you were born into a dysfunctional relationship with God. The dysfunction is all yours. God and his justice has to deal with it. That's a problem for us. He exercises his justice and his holiness and the sinners were all condemned. Jesus comes dies in our place, takes our condemnation upon himself. So when, G when God looks at us, he looks at us through the lens of Jesus Christ. For those of us that have accepted that, now we're forgiven. 
our biggest problem has been solved, and that is what happens to my soul? Jesus is like, I got that one. Don't worry about that. So then, every other problem you face is smaller in comparison. A friend of mine was telling me about a conversation he had with one of the lifers, guy that's in for life. He's not gonna... When he leaves that prison, he will do so in a coffin. Imagine that. And the question was put to him, how do you deal with this? You know, and he's a Christian. How do you deal with this as a, as a Christian, day in and day out, knowing you will never leave this place? You will die in here. How do you deal with that? And he says, you got a pen, you got a paper. And so he, he, he takes the, the paper and he writes a dot. And then from that dot, he writes a line all the way to the edge of the paper. And he says, this dot represents my daily existence here in prison, okay? It's just a dot. It's just a speck. This line represents my eternity with Jesus Christ. This is just a small thing, isn't it? And so I live today in light of what is to come in eternity. So no problem. I can make it day to day to day because I know what awaits me. And I thought, <sighs> okay, convicted. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, okay, prisoner, thanks for the sermon. I'm like, that'll preach. You know? But see, we're too distracted to think in those terms. We're too distracted. We're, we're too anxious. We're too caught up in things. Now, he's not that concerned about it because his situation from all external perspectives is so dim. And he's like, hey, I'm good. I, I know what awaits me, so here I am. Whatever amount of days God has for me, my soul is at rest. So Jesus used a couple of really interesting words. Like, I gotta get to these, because this is important. Jesus is specific with the language. When he says the yoke is easy, the burden is light, he's talking about bearing it with us. Obviously, bearing it alone is unbearable. But with Jesus, it's easy and light. He describes easy with the Greek word krestos. And the word krestos can also be translated as well-fitting. So, back in the day, there were a couple of different types of yokes. You had a generic yoke that would fit around the necks of animals, but then you had yokes that were custom-made. They were specifically designed for each animal so that they would fit as not to be too tight or too loose, but just specific to that creature. And those were the best kind. Jesus says, when you yoke yourself to me, it's a perfect fit. It is the perfect fit. Because I know what you're carrying and I know exactly how to help you. It's tailor-made just for you because I know you better than you know yourself. So when you are attached to me, it actually becomes a custom fit to your anxieties and your burdens. Now, having said this, let me be clear in adding this. Be very careful who you yoke yourself to in this life because what lies in them will be put on you and you will experience the weight of that person's burden. Let me say it again. Be very careful who you yoke yourself to in this life because what lies in them will be laid on you and you will feel the weight of their burdens. This is why it's very, very important to yoke yourself spiritually in marriage to another who has a solid, firm foundation of being yoked to Jesus. So my wife, if you know her, she's the closest thing to a saint on earth. She must be because she's married to me. <laughs> and we have issues. It's really hard sometimes. It'd be super challenging. The strength of our marriage is not that we are yoked together, although we are. That's not the strength of our marriage. The strength of our marriage is that I'm yoked to Jesus and she's yoked to Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? And because 
I follow Jesus' lead, that makes me the husband she needs me to be, right? Because I'll tell you, there are times when I wake up, let me use hers now, I'm certain there are times when she wakes up and she's like, you know what, Jason's not so lovable today. <laughs> what, what gets you through that? Well, what is Jesus calling me to do? What is Jesus calling her to do? See, that's the foundation, that's the discipleship yoke that lightens the burdens that you carry and the burdens you might impose onto those around you. That's how good the yoke of Jesus is. Notice Jesus doesn't say, throw off every yoke. Why? Because we're all gonna attach ourselves to something. This is why people get wrapped up in alcohol, drugs, pornography, overeating, overexercising, all as a form of escapism, and those turn out to be really lousy yokes. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, does Jesus say, hey, be yourself. No, he says, be who God created you to be. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, hey, yoke yourself to your feelings and your own thoughts. Your thoughts and feelings do not square with the reality of God's wisdom as revealed in the scripture. That's a lousy yoke. Don't yoke yourself to yourself. So this isn't a, a passive experience. It's, it's dynamic when you follow Jesus in this way. Uh, I don't have as much wisdom as many, but having a few decades on the planet, one thing I realized is stuff comes into your life that you don't anticipate, and it will test, it will test you. Life has a way of taking things away from you. Life has a way of bringing things to you that you do not want. And then what do you do? What do you do? Augustine was a philosopher and theologian who lived in the fourth century AD. Really bright individual, born to a godly mother, but like many of us, decided to stray, go his own way as he got a little bit older. He wanted to throw off the shackles of his mother's faith. So he went out and he pursued all the things in life that he thought would make him happy. And he yoked himself to things that ultimately began to undo him. He wandered back. His mom was godly. She threw many, many, many tear-filled prayers receives her son back. Later, he would write a book called Confessions. It's about his time in the wilderness. And he famously said, here's what I discovered in my pursuit of what I thought would make me happy. Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. The animated classic Pinocchio, I'm talking about the Classic Pinocchio, right? The animated classic Pinocchio. I don't know who wrote that. Incredibly insightful. You know the story, you remember? All Pinocchio wants is to be set free from the strings. I wanna be a boy. I wanna be a real boy. I wanna be a real boy. He gets what he wants. And then he finds himself where? Pleasure Island. And he's there with all the other guys who are just like, yes, we finally get to be ourselves. Do what we wanna do. No restrictions. They're burning things. They're trashing things. And man, what he begins to discover is this. <gasps> I am now a victim to my own passions. And slowly, he begins to transform into a donkey. And it's kind of horrifying because there's no humans in the story. You know what I'm saying? It's all these creepy animals. And it's kind of sad because he can feel himself slipping away and he calls out, mom, 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 mom. But it's, it's like it's almost too late. And as he's turning into this donkey, all of a sudden his conscience returns, Jiminy Cricket. And he's able to extract himself from it just before it's too late. Almost a donkey. Now, Jordan Peterson has an incredibly insightful commentary on this. He asks you this. What makes you a jackass? <laughs> it's good, isn't it? You understand the point? What makes you a jackass? It is whatever you yoke yourself to. That's the answer. So these, the words of Jesus were quite beautiful. Am I a good dad? Am I a good father? Am I a good husband? Do I have what it takes? Can I lead a church? Am I lovable? Do people respect me? Do they even notice me? Are they concerned about me? Man, I have these issues and these problems. It's in my heart. It's in every human heart, restlessness. Augustine was exactly right. In the Garden of Eden, 
Adam and Eve had it all. Perfect environment. You can have the perfect parent and still have kids that rebel. It's all yours, God says. Just one restriction. Stay away from this tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Don't mess with it. It's gonna be very bad for you. You're gonna experience something you were never intended to experience. Stay away from it. That scene closes. The next scene opens, and Satan appears. And what does he do? He speaks right to the restlessness of the human heart. And essentially what he says is, take off that yoke. Take off God's yoke and live. And they take it off and die. Their first act, they hide. And that's what sin causes us to do. We hide from God, we hide stuff from each other. Sin at its core is hiddenness. Jesus says, be careful removing God's yoke. Be careful in your attempt to deconstruct when you have nothing better to replace it with. Oh, but you don't understand that yet because you're like a little toddler, all of us. And so when God speaks, it is in our best interest. He sees the trajectory, knows the trajectory, built into the fabric of his creation. It's best just to listen. I will give you rest. It's a promise. And when Jesus makes a promise, he always delivers. Bow your heads, close your eyes. This is an important part of our time together. Reflect a little bit. If your burden is too heavy, if your load is overwhelming, you're not attached to the right person. What is the burden? And picture Jesus stepping into that and taking whatever rocks, so to speak, might be in your backpack and carrying them for you. He's already, he's already carried the heaviest load you have, and that is the weight of your sin. Everything else, that's small in comparison for him. Big to you, but you'll realize their proper place when you are attached to his yoke. Father, it's a blessing to receive these words from scripture. Super thankful for the people that we're about to hear from who have entered into that discipleship space wanting to declare their commitment to you. God, we ask that you would lead each one of us as only you can do. I pray that we wouldn't resist, that we wouldn't fight it, that we would give in. We would experience all of your glory, the glory that you manifest towards us, revealing who you are, your capabilities, your power, your strength. And when that happens, it's always in our best interest. That's what we're asking for, Lord. We always, always ask it in the one who makes it all possible. His name is Jesus Christ, and God's people said,